Good day. My name is Jim Gates. I am the president-elect of the American Physical Society. And yesterday, something quite remarkable happened. I received an invitation from a friend, Dr. Sylvia Panati, to give this special presentation at the Strings 2020 meeting. It's my very great pleasure to do this, although I must admit my surprise is sort of overwhelming. The worldwide response of moral revulsion triggered by the broad dissemination of a video showing the extrajudicial execution of Mr. George Floyd, which was a crescendo to far too many such occurrences, has compelled even the organizers of String 2020 to engage me in this conversation for their global cyberspace attendees. Thus, I feel compelled to respond. Let me start by reviewing a recent report in the United States. The American Institute of Physics uh, has completed a report called The Time Is Now, Systemic Changes to Increase African Americans with that Bachelor's Degrees in Physics and Astronomy. There's a national test task force uh, that worked for over a year. And let's look at some of the details. Uh, the co-chair of, uh, of the report, number two, were Dr. Mary James of Reed College and Professor and Dr. Edmund Bertschinger of MIT. The team of task force members were 10 in number, Brian Bigfoot, Tabitha Dobbins, Sharon Friesbrick, myself, Jedediah Isler, Maria Ong, Marlissa Richardson, Quentin Williams, Philip Bowhammer, and Arlene Modeste was the team of project manager. The effort of this report was rather unusual in that it was based on research, that is, sociological researchers helped design a series of questionnaires that were sent out to African-American students to ascertain what was the nature of their experience. Now, this is, of course, in the presence of a background. If we look at the number and percentage of bachelor's degrees earned by African-Americans from a period of 1999 to 2017, what we find is that for, uh, for the number of African-Americans, uh, we see some fluctuation. It fluctuates uh, from about 150 to just under 300. That percentage is uh, between 5% and, unfortunately, 4%. The number of bachelor's degrees earned in physics from 1955 to 2018 uh, looks uh, <coughs> as the slide that shows next, where we see a purple region uh, showing that around 1955, there were just over 2,500 bachelor's degrees earned by every student in the United States up until 2018, where that number is 9,000. Is 9, if we look at the growth of bachelor's degrees awarded to African Americans, looking at all colleges, what we find is something very anomalous. If we look at all STEM fields, we find that there's a growth uh, from just, uh, I'm sorry, percentage growth, that if we start with 1995, which I referenced, starts with 0%. By 2017, there's over 100% growth in all STEM disciplines. Some of these disciplines, of course, are very different in the way they responded. For example, if we look at the earth sciences, their percentage growth is over 200% in this period. On the other hand, if we look at engineering, the growth there is about 60%. Uh, chemistry uh, has fluctuated over time, but even in chemistry, we see over a 50% growth rate of all of the STEM fields what we find is that physics has the slowest and lowest percentage of growth rate over this time frame. And in particular, we can uh, look at the issue about, is it all minority students? And what we find on the next slide is the answer is no. A reference point is to look at Hispanic students, and this is a study that was done in 2009, as shown in figure three on my slides. And what we find is for Hispanic students, the uh, growth uh, from 1994, to 2017, those were about 2% to about 8%. Over that same time period, essentially we see no growth in the percentage of African-American bachelor's degrees awarded to African-American bachelor's degrees who were awarded in the area of physics. So our field of physics is very anomalous. 
Now, this uh, is a problem that was uncovered by studying the data. And because after all, we're physicists, we, we like data. But what can we do about it? Well, there are a number of things that are in this stem up report. And I hope the person who is showing my slides will share with you the, uh, the www.aip.org website. If you just Google the expression STEM and AIP and team up, you will be likely able to find the report. And it is chock full of statistics as well as comments from the students being interviewed. It has a series of recommendations that people are looking to implement. And one of the recent things that we've initiated here in the United States is a new coalition. It's called Delta Phi for Change Physics. Uh, roughly a week ago, we, Delta Phi had its inaugural webinar. Uh, it was well attended. We had over 2,700 uh, registrants at the beginning of a two-hour session. And by the end of the session, there were 1,600 pairs of eyes still looking. Now this Delta Phi is a coalition. It's a coalition built of the American Physical Society, the American Institute of Physics, the National Society of Black Physicists, the, American, the African American Women in Physics Organization, and a new group of young physicists, the Beyond the Standard Model Pandemic, and then finally, the American Association of Physics Teachers. This is also a video that you can find online. In fact, you've probably seen part of it in my presentation today, if things go as planned. And this effort is a coalition. We want to make a difference. And in particular, uh, given the situation with Mr. Floyd, there's a lot of attention on, in asking questions. What are the barriers that African Americans, or more generally, people of color encounter as they enter our field? So. That is, if you're really motivated to make a difference, I tell young people, join in. Join these organizations that are trying to make a difference. In our first webinar, we actually showed a number of levers and tools that interested parties can use to try to make their individual contribution to making a difference. What I'd like to do next is something rather different from my presentation uh, during the webinar. Uh, the person who uh, has my transparencies uh, can either go uh, along as I talk or uh, these transparencies, I believe, will be made available to anyone who's actually interested in this session. So I have some recollections, basically. Uh, I will be 70 years old uh, in December, assuming all goes well, of course. And I, since 1995, I've been preserving small, a small number of written reflections on my journey and observations as a scientist who is African-American. These works are in the form of essays, not published didactic narratives. And each essay is a freestanding document, though there are con conceptual links and overlaps between them. Each was written after a period of some duration focused on answering a question raised by someone else. If left to my own natural tendencies, I would return to a different sort of question. Namely, why is the mathematics of space-time supersymmetry that lies at the foundation and heart of string theory so incompletely and poorly understood? However, pushed by other people interested in talking about these questions, I thought about these matters. The majorities of my writings address questions ar uh, around post-secondary education and the struggle to maintain the meager and modest progress that has occurred within my lifetime. These do not deeply engage the question of whether, I, what ideas of whether in STEM disciplines an I, a concept can be black, nor if such uh, do exist, do they matter? These are not the kinds of questions that I as a trained physicist know how to answer. Neither have I written on the question of whether racism is systemic or a fractal tessellation in their disciplines. This is something that people can study for decades or perhaps centuries. Again, I'm not qualified to answer that question. However, I can tell you something has changed in my lifetime. The prima facie evidence for this is by my very existence as the first African-American theoretical physicist elected to the US National Academy of Sciences since it was established by President Lincoln. And this makes progress impossible for me to deny. I do not represent myself as an authority in this complicated domain 
of human society as I will only present my thoughts for others to assay, contemplate, evaluate, and weigh as they come to decisions about their own beliefs and actions. I fervently wish I could present data or mathematics as that is the foundation with which we scientists are most familiar and comfortable. Unfortunately, the numbers of relevant data points is so small that I can only offer anecdotes and thoughts that are derived from these. Before I provide the promised links leading to my thoughts, because I don't have time to actually go over them, there's one other figure I believe, especially physicists, might wish to consult on the matter of racist practices committed against African Americans in the US. And of course, we see echoes of these practices and treatments towards many people around the world. Unfortunately, to many of us, a residue of this seems to apply in physics and more generally, the STEM disciplines. If there's a secular pope in the magisterium of physics, it's Albert Einstein. Though almost universally revered by physicists, very few are aware of what Albert Einstein described as a disease he found in the USA. One should be aware that even Einstein was not a perfect being, not a being of perfect perfection on the topic of race. This was demonstrated by some of his writings after a visit to Asia in the early 1920s. However, he spoke powerfully about his impressions of racism directed towards African-Americans in his adopted country after immigrating here. So in the following, I will recommend to my fellow physicists thoughts from Albert Einstein via a set of links. Once again, we don't have the time to dig very deeply into these. Uh, if you are interested, please go to these links and read and learn about what Albert Einstein said about race in America. I hope the content will prove to be useful to the reader. So there's a series of links I have about writings from Albert Einstein. The first is actually a book. So Einstein didn't write the book. The authors are Jerry, uh, Fred Jerome, and Roger Taylor. The book is entitled Einstein on Race and Racism. It was actually published in 2006. And I believe it is still available to the public. Uh, for the slides that I have accompanying my talk, there are, there's a link to it. And you can dig into that and see what Einstein said because it was quite powerful in his description and his decrying the practices that he saw in the United States. The second link uh, that I'm providing shows something very interesting about Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein made a visit to an Afro, for, to a all black college called Lincoln College in 1946 or 47. It was at a time when he basically had stopped giving commencement addresses at universities, but he made an exception uh, on this particular time. And the second link actually has some photographs of Einstein on the Lincoln University campus, meeting with the president, uh, President Bond, who in fact is the father of the famous civil rights worker, Julian Bond. In fact, Julian Bond met Einstein on this occasion, and you can read about this at the second link. I have had the pleasure of meeting Fred Jerome and Roger Taylor, who unfortunately is deceased now, some years ago in 2007, the three of us were at Harvard talking about some of the results in uh, their book, Einstein on Race and Racism. And that link is still active. You can go there. It has some comments. And one of the things at that presentation that I thought about was why Einstein? How did Einstein get to these thoughts? Uh, finally, there's a, at link number four, you can see a copy of the, new, of the newspapers that heralded and recognized Einstein's unusual commencement address in 1946. And this is uh, the links for number four and five about Einstein. My own uh, tra trajectory has been rather interesting to me as I think about it from the outside. It started in 1995. I wrote an article called Equity Versus Excellence, A False Dichotomy in Science and Society. This is available at the link shown under number one. And this was the first time I started thinking about, based on my experiences, what, it, what, is, what is the role of diversity? How can we balance this about equity and excellence? Because I always tell people, if we lose excellence, we lose the reason that physics is so very important. The second link that I uh, am indicating with my slides is an article I wrote which were about my thoughts on creativity, 
diversity and innovation in science and engineering. Uh, this was a, a piece that was actually solicited uh, from me, as all of my writings in this area are. And this was for a, 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 a book, a, a, I'm sorry, a publication called Diversity in the Law that was created by a coalition of organizations, including the American uh, Association of Universities, among others. Uh, this particular essay has actually uh, taken on a life of its own. You can actually see the uh, essay by going to the second part of the uh, number two link. And strangely enough, this very essay has been cited by the Supreme Court. The third link there actually will show you the essay in the context of the citation by the Supreme Court. I think this means I'm maybe the only living theoretical physicist whose writing have been cited by the U.S. Supreme Court. And then finally, there's a short essay that I wrote uh, around the question of affirmative action in diversity in college admissions. It was in response to a very interesting question that was asked in 207 by Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, there was a hearing underway. Arguments were uh, going back and forth. And the Chief Justice asked the question, what particular value does a minority student bring to a physics class? Now, I was in Australia when this question was asked, but the reporter reached out to me and asked me what I thought about. I thought the question was very peculiar, and I do wonder about its origin. But this short essay under the fourth link is my response to Chief Justice Roberts. And once again, I in invite anyone who's interested in this domain to go ahead and study uh, these links. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to Dr. Panati. Thank you to Jeff Murugan, who I haven't actually seen in decades, having first met him in 2000 on my second visit to South Africa. And I wish everyone the very best. I understand that the Strings 2020 meeting has been fantastic. And go and do some great physics, because what else are you going to do? Bye-bye.